Members, we are open to the public. And I just want to remind everyone that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings as well as online. We currently have uh, four members attending in total. We've got three members attending in person, myself, Emma Shear, Mike Nesbitt, the Vice Chair, Michelle McElveen, and via Starleaf we have Joan O'Dowd. Uh, we don't have any formal apologies and we're expecting uh, Paula Bradshaw to join us via Starleaf slightly later on in the meeting and Christopher Stalford to join us in the room. So with that we can go to uh, agenda item number one and as I say we don't have any apologies unless any members have any. So the second item on our agenda today we've got a briefing on Brexit and the wider implications for human rights in the north uh, by Professor Colm O'Kennedy. Colm um, is a Professor of Constitutional and Human Rights Law at University College London. Professor O'Kennedy has, has acted as Specialist Legal Advisor to Westminster's Joint Committee on Human Rights and its Women and Equalities Committee and has advised a range of international organisations including the UN and European Com Commission. So with that I would like to welcome Professor O'Kennedy to the meeting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is um, a great honour for uh, me to have been invited to um, to speak to you this afternoon, and I hope everything is uh, proceeding okay with the technology. Um, and tell me, as ever, as I tell my students repeatedly, if I've begun to fade out or you need anything, repeat it or uh, reiterate it. Um, the, I'm, what, I'm, what I've been asked to do is to um, speak to you for around five, ten minutes on um, the implications of Brexit for human rights protection in uh, the UK in general, with specific reference, of course, to uh, Northern Ireland. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus primarily on what I regard as the, the live issues um, in relation to the human rights impact of Brexit, and those perhaps with particular impact on wider debate relating to the constitutional status of Northern Ireland and um, the Bill of Rights ongoing conversation. Um, Brexit has been described as being uh, potentially human rights neutral in the sense of there isn't anything intrinsic about the Brexit process which, if well managed, would necessarily lead to a diminution and our reduction in human rights protection, subject to that qualifier, if everything is well managed. Um, the, and, and the debate over the last few, three, four years with Brexit has been an ongoing discussion about how has the process of Brexit as, it's, as it has unfolded what implications has that had for human rights protection? In my evidence this afternoon, I'm going to um, not focus on one set of issues relating to the human rights impact of, on Brexit, which is the impact on uh, non-UK or non-Irish nationals resident in the UK. The, there's a whole set of that. Uh, potential human rights issues there relation to right to privacy, to family life, data protection, employment rights, non-discrimination rights, and so on, um, which have largely been resolved as negotiations have unfolded over the last few years, have been largely resolved as part of the withdrawal agreement with the EU. Um, and I'm not going to go into those uh, issues unless the committee wishes to raise them subsequently. Um, instead, I'm going to focus on um, what perhaps are the more structural issues related to the impact of Brexit, which is to say those issues that, um, which are to say the issues arising from the impact of Brexit upon existing legal protection for human rights. And in particular, I'm going to focus on perhaps the most significant area of, of most significant area of impact of, of Brexit, which is its impact on um, equality and non-discrimination and employment rights in particular. And Brexit's impact here is is of particular um, has particular impact in respect of Northern Ireland, as I'm sure members of the committee will be aware. So I'm going to focus in that, on that in particular. Um, the key issue here, bearing in mind the limited time allocated to me, um, the key issue 
here, which I've tried to set out in the written evidence I have ri written briefing I've already submitted to the committee. The key, the key issue here is that um, substantial parts of UK and in particular Northern Irish law as it relates to the enjoyment of equality, non-discrimination, employment rights more generally, were um, generated by EU law, either through the direct application of EU treaty requirements, for example, Article 157 of the EU treaty, the guarantee of equal pay for work of equal value, or else through various EU equality directives, such as the Framework Equality Directive 2078, um, which required all member states to prohibit discrimination on the grounds of um, sexual orientation and age and religious discrimination, among other grounds, in, 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 occupation, in employment and occupation. Um, and not alone did you have um, EU legislation in the form of treaties and directives, you also had the jurisprudence, the case law of the Court of Justice of the EU has been very influential in interpreting these EU legal requirements. And then, of course, UK law had to uh, uh, give effect to the Court of Justice's interpretation of these treaty directives and implement it in, in, in UK law. Um, the effect of that, to cut a long story short, is that much of UK law as it currently stands has been shaped and moulded by EU anti-discrimination law. Um, with significant areas of the law, in particular, for example, the rights of pregnant workers, um, are the rights of certain categories of persons with disabilities have been almost completely, have been predominantly generated by uh, EU law. Um, that, of course, gives rise to the question of what happens now that the UK has exited the EU. Um, as members of the Commission will, will, will be aware, it, EU law remains in force. It, it, it changes legal status. It becomes this thing called retained EU law, which continues in, 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 in force after Brexit, after the transition period ends on 31st of December, um, unless it is subsequently modified by Acts of Parliament, Acts of the devolved legislators, or indeed ministerial regulation. Um, the, the particular significance of this in the Northern Ireland context is that um, much of the Northern Irish legislation relating to equality and non-discrimination rights has been, is, is either, um, is much of, sorry, much of the existing, of existing Northern Irish law, I should say, relating to equality and non-discrimination, either involves the direct application of EU standards or else has been enacted by ministerial regulation over the decades. Um, so the key provisions of Northern Irish law in relation to sexual orientation discrimination, for example, um, the type of issue that was, um, the type of, of claim that was at issue in the, uh, in, the, in the Asher's Bakery case last year, for example, over the last few years, um, are much of that, um, of, 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 of that law is actually developed through ministerial regulations. Um, and, the, and the particular significance is that now that all retained EU law becomes adjustable by UK law going forward, it means that much of Northern Irish equality and anti-discrimination law, which was once quasi-constitutionalised, as I described it in my evidence, has been protected, if you want, locked into place by the fact it was required by EU law, now that EU law no longer is no longer locking in the relevant Northern Irish law, this means that it reverts back to being, if you want, changeable UK law. And because so much of it has been established by ministerial regulation, or involves interpretations by the Court of Justice then subsequently applied by the UK courts. This means much of existing Northern Irish law is potentially amendable by ministerial regulation, um, mainly by the powers of the Secretary of State, actually, um, under the EU, withdrawal, um, the EU uh, withdrawal Act 2018, where the uh, uh, Secretary of State in Westminster, Secretary of State, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, it would be, um, has very extensive powers to adjust and modify retained UK law under 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 Henry VIII clauses and similar measures, which give the Secretary of State very wide powers to adjust that law. Um, 
This is a particular issue I, 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 for Northern Ireland, as I said, because of how much of Northern Irish law is regulation-based. And therefore, since it's regulation-based, it can be changed by ministerial regulation. Now, the situation is, is, is different to a large extent in Britain. Um, because the Equality Act 2010 applies to England, Scotland and Wales. Now, this is Westminster legislation. It is the controlling uh, legal norm and play, which means that most of equality and anti-discrimination law in Britain can't be changed by ministerial regulation. It would require a Act of Parliament, an, an amendment to be made to the Equality Act 2010. But all of this means, to cut a very long story short, and I apologize for the complexity of my briefing and the complexity of the legal issues, is that Brexit has had the particular impact of Northern Ireland of deconstitutionalizing much of its uh, equality, anti-discrimination, employment rights framework more generally, and of making existing Northern Irish law easy to alter by ministerial regulation as distinct from um, parliamentary legislation. And as we, as, as you will be aware, perhaps more than I will be, um, regulations are much easier to implement. Law changeable by regulation is much easier to adjust and isn't subject to the same um, legislative processes as changes by full primary legislation. So Brexit has, to summarise, a particular impact on human rights protection in the case of Northern Ireland by virtue of how it puts, shall we say, a question mark over much of existing Northern Irish law relating to equality, discrimination, employment rights in general, and makes it much easier to amend by the executive. Um, that's 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 the brief summary of the of of, of the written uh, briefing, written evidence I submitted to the committee, and I would be uh, delighted if you have any follow up questions or queries or anything you want to ask me about this or indeed wider topics. Thank Professor, thank you very much. Um, we've we've had a range of presentations now at this stage. Um, we've been meeting, I suppose, every week since the summer, and we've had um, contributions from many academics and people involved in, in human rights and um, professors from different universities on this topic. And the constant thing that we're discussing, obviously, is Brexit and the remit of this committee as pair in DNA to consider the creation of the Bill of Rights, consider in both the particular circumstances as laid out in, in 1998, and then the impact that Brexit would have on that. And a note that you've mentioned in your presentation that you feel that because of the, the article and the protocol that protects this floor as set out by the EU. And I suppose the question that I keep coming back to is, and you've said that if, if the protocol um, arrangements are abandoned in a couple of years' time, does a Bill of Rights then in that instance allow us to reintroduce that floor or indeed improve upon what, what we currently have? Mm. Yes, that's... Uh, oh, sorry. You're muted, maybe? Uh, am I unmuted oh, now? You know. um, sorry. Right, perfect. I apologise. I've, I've, I have the terror of my students with my incapacity with muting and unmuting. Um, yes, I, I, I didn't discuss the protocol a lot in my in my in my oral presentation just now, but it's it's analysed in detail in the paper. Um, of course, in the case of Northern Ireland, um, the protocol maintains the provisions of the protocol maintains key elements of EU law in force in the specific context of Northern Ireland. Now, I, I deliberately didn't emphasize this in my oral briefing because, of course, the protocol is um, a subject of some political debate and is, 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 is obviously something that is, 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 is potentially up for renewal in four years as per the renewal mechanism set out in the protocol mechanism itself. Therefore, the protocol is, from a legal perspective, from a strictly legal perspective, a, um, a recurring temporary solution in the sense of, um, I don't mean that in the political sense, I mean in, in the legal sense, is that it is for now something that locks in existing EU laws relates to equality and non-discrimination rights. Therefore, for now, its effect um, is to uh, retain the constitutionalization of 
anti-discrimination equality law, which EU used to provide. But obviously, that's a, a, a legal embedding of equality and non-discrimination rights that is subject to the fortunes of the protocol, which, for example, would fall away in four years' time if the protocol were not to be renewed. Now, of course, this gives rise to the question, it, might there be an argument for having an alternative mechanism, a more permanent mechanism, a different mechanism? for embedding equality and non-discrimination rights. And I, I, I have to say, um, in my expert opinion, that the um, using the protocol as the primary mechanism for embedding equality and non-discrimination rights has its disadvantages. This, this, the the four-year potential cutoff point is means that in four years' time, um, everything could become up for grabs once again. You would be back to the original legal situation I sketched out in my in my briefing. So, so if the if if the views of this committee and of um, of the elected representatives in in the Northern Ireland Assembly were that we want something more permanent, more embedded longer lasting, less subject to the churn of politics that will surround the protocol, then I think there are good grounds for thinking very, very seriously about having a Bill of Rights framework that would embed protection for equality and anti-discrimination norms. And that would become the established vehicle for locking in this level of protection rather than what's been done at the moment, which is relying on the protocol with all the politics and all the uncertainty that comes in its wake. Thank you. I, I suppose that what you've just, your, the final part of your comments there sort of hit the nail on the head because, as I alluded to earlier, we've had different legal experts giving us advice on this and this consensus sort of has been that there isn't really consensus. We know that we're probably going to maintain some of the charter rights. We know that we're supposed to be keeping the ECHR in its entirety, but there are different views as to what exactly will maintain what we risk losing, whether or not the Internal Market Bill go, goes through um, as originally written will have an impact on that. So there's an awful lot of uncertainty and I suppose this the, the idea then that we could come up with our own Bill of Rights that, that ticks those boxes and sort of gives us that level playing field to, to begin with um, is, is key. But no, thank you very much. I'm going to pass now to the Vice Chair, Mike. Chair, thank you, and Professor, good afternoon, and thank you for your engagement. It's much appreciated. Um, <clears throat> you, you say that the, the equality laws that we have are largely uh, enforced through ministerial um, regulations, and <clears throat> you go on to suggest that that means they are uniquely easy to amend, which sounds very handy. Uh, but in paragraph 22, of your submission, you make clear that Section 21 of the EU Withdrawal Agreement confers on UK ministers uh, powers which you describe as Henry VIII-like in terms of being able to amend our laws without much in the way of parliamentary oversight or formal consultation. So would I be right in thinking that that could take us back to the dark days of direct rule where much legislation for Northern Ireland came uh, by an order in council which could not be amended so that local MPs could either vote for it or against it, but they, they couldn't improve it. Yes, that, that, is, that is precisely the, um, the, the potential concern, that you could have a scenario where um, e e UK ministers using their um, regulatory powers under the EU Withdrawal Act would modify retained EU law. That has a knock-on effect on the Northern Irish law, much of which is incorporated EU law. Um, and so you could end up in a situation, for example, where you have equality and anti-discrimination protection as it applies in Northern Ireland being modified and, and being modified specifically by orders in council enacted by the Secretary of State as distinct from the uh, devolved institutions in instrument. So that's precisely the, the potential concern. Now, it is a complicated legal area. Um, and, and there are potential differences between um, the ministers have wider, the Secretary of State, um, UK ministers, I should say, will have wider powers to amend EU law, or at least have, have greater freedom to amend EU law than in some respects they might have in respect of 
Northern Irish law. So there's a little bit of a, an uncertainty there. But in general, the picture is, as you present it, that it certainly opens up the potential of orders and council becoming used as a tool to amend and adjust uh, e e Northern Irish equality and anti-discrimination law in, in potentially quite far-reaching ways. The, the, there is also, I think, some uncertainty um, with regard to those who believe that uh, we could end up with, with people having different rights in this jurisdiction depending on whether they are British or Irish. Uh, now, last week, Dominic Grieve said he wasn't sure that that would be the case, that there would be a difference. Uh, am I to assume that if the retained EU laws are not amended by UK ministers, that there will be no difference? The, um, oh, the, there, there are interesting complexities in all of this. And when it comes to the, um, which is, of course, lawyers speak for, um, <laughs> for uh, messiness. Um, when it comes to, the, to employment rights, to equality and non-discrimination rights, um, the, if EU law isn't changed, it gives reasonably, um, it, 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 it it gives a certain level of protection against discrimination against people who would classify themselves as Irish national, ethnically Irish, however way you want to you want to frame that identity identity basis. Um, so too do other elements of law, in particular the the, um, the UK embedded legislation as well, separate and distinct from EU law. Um, but the overall effect is that if things stay, stay at the moment, if things remain in place as, as they are at the moment, if, for example, the protocol remains in force, the provisions of Article 2 of the protocol relating to this, if they remain in force, then the legal situation will not change, that the, your, 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 your classification as British or Irish will not affect your employment status, will not be able to affect your employment status. The, the anti-discrimination protection will kick in there to all intents and purposes, um, subject to certain complicated facets of immigration law, as highlighted by the D'Souza case, which you may be, which you are probably aware of, we were probably you're certainly aware of, um, which, which I, I, I won't go into because they're, they relate more to the sort of immigration employment law interface. But in general, the existing state of affairs will minimize um, the possibility for discrimination to emerge based on British Irish identity, British Irish nationality, are similar related facets. And in, in terms of employment law, Professor, and I haven't, haven't thought this through to to any great degree, but if if the UK government was to change our employment laws in a way that the EU did not like, is it possible that they could impose um, something sort of equivalent to the McBride principles for trading with Northern Ireland, where they would say this will only happen if you impose and obey the following employment laws or regulations. That's a, that's a very interesting question. The, um, for that to happen, you would have to have a breakdown of the protocol mechanism effectively. You would have to have either the, the protocol mechanism effectively being overruled by regulation or legislation subsequent to, um, to it coming into place. Um, but you could, you could certainly, you could see, you could, it, it certainly is hypothetically possible that the protocol mechanism could be overruled. And obviously, after four years, it might lapse if not renewed. And then it is possible to envisage a hypothetical scenario where um, UK non-compliance with the protocol, um, well, what was in the protocol, uh, leading to a lessening of equality, non-discrimination protection, would generate political tensions, resulting in some sort of movement from McBride principles to be to be kicking in as regards um, in respect of Northern Ireland and the UK more generally. Um, of course, by that stage, you'd be reaching quite a degree of political meltdown. 
um, in the in the EU UK Northern Irish Republic of Ireland relationship. Um, that complicated relationship would have uh, sort of collapsed into a sort of molten slag of tension, I think, at that point, not to be too dramatic about it. Um, but you could certainly see this sort of scenario arising. And, and, and even before you get, the, you, you get to that scenario, um, it would be quite easy to see heightened tensions arising from shifts and adjustments to equality and non-discrimination law introduced via regulation. I mean, you, you, you see the tensions that have already materialized in relation to the internal market bill and the proposed and the the adjustments it makes, the proposed adjustments it makes there to the protocol, which involve giving UK ministers the power to override the protocol, as you will be aware. Um, you could uh, and, and those issues relate primarily to questions of state aid and the customs relationship between Northern Ireland and the rest of and, and the rest of the UK. I mean, you could imagine, and if you bear in mind the tensions that has generated, you could, it's easily to envisage easy to envisage a much heightened level of tension if it came to adjustments to the existing equality and anti-discrimination legal framework. Um, basically, and, and I realize I'm giving the committee very, very lawyery answers. I apologize. It's, my, uh, it's the curse of my, uh, of my legal expertise profession. Um, but um, basically, if the, um, basically, there are substantial advantages in keeping the ship steady as it goes, in maintaining the existing quo and finding ways to lock it into some sort of, of, of Bill of Rights embedded framework. The more changeable the legal situation is, the potential, the, the, the rockier the waters you might find yourself in in unanticipated ways five, 10, 15 years down the track. Thank you. F finally, and, and perhaps briefly, um, do you take a view on whether, if there is a Bill of Rights, it should come through Westminster or the Northern Ireland Assembly? That, I think, depends on, um, on what you want to achieve with the Bill of Rights. Uh, so I am going to neatly bounce that question back to yourselves and the, <laughs> the committee, in a way. I think that's a political decision in terms of what you want to achieve in the Bill of Rights. Obviously, legally speaking, if the Bill of Rights is to have any sort of um, embedded status within the UK and to have an impact on Westminster legislation, then Westminster will probably have to be involved in the process. If it's something you see playing out solely within the scope of uh, the devolved authority of, of the Northern Irish Assembly, then that's a different matter. But much, but everything depends on what you want the Bill of Rights to do. And, and that's, uh, I'm glad to say, a political choice, not really a legal choice. Very nicely handled, Professor. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Michelle. Okay, thank you, and thank you very much for your presentation. Just in preparation for the session, I noticed that you'd given a lecture entitled Rescuing Human Rights Against the New Minimalism. And obviously you state that you feel that human rights are in a, in a time of crisis and you challenge a lot of the presumptions, perhaps, around a minimalist approach. So by virtue of that, I suppose, I'm going to assume that you're a maximalist. So I um, really just want to ask whether that <coughs> is the approach then that you would apply to a Northern Ireland framework for a Bill of Rights. That, uh, that's a very good question. Um, in, in that particular lecture, I claimed to be a, a, a not a minimalist, but not necessarily to be a maximalist, okay. either, but certainly not a minimalist. Um, but I think that's uh, that's a very good question. The um, in overall on the Bill of Rights I I issue, um, I can see clear advantages in attempting to of. In attempting to build in a solid, tangible floor of rights protection and to give it some sort of embedded status, as embedded as can be done within the UK constitutional structure and the confines of the Belfast Agreement in general. And then by building in that structure to avoid human rights issues in Northern Ireland, including equality and discrimination issues, becoming subject to the type of intense political uh, disputes we're seeing arising in the context of the protocol. Um, in, in fact, I, I must say the, uh, the tensions around the protocol, um, I think, neatly illustrate the problem that um, there are many things that could go wrong in the future, uh, especially in the post-Brexit environment. And 
many of these issues have the potential to blow up and to become very destabilizing very, 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 very quickly. And I think there are personally, I think there are clear political advantages, but also legal advantages in attempting to quasi embed as much legal rights protection as you can, was that clear space in a way for political debates to develop. I mean, for example, let me be very frank, debates about the protocol might be less charged if the protocol wasn't also carrying the burden of quite a lot of rights protection. Article two of the protocol covering equality and discrimination rights. That's a big burden for an instrument that's primarily all about state aid, customs regulation, maintaining an open border, and so on. Um, it's, there's this human rights baggage piled onto an already straining legal mechanism. And it seems to me that the more you take that baggage off a mechanism like the protocol and put it onto some human rights, bill of rights, specialist embedded mechanism, the less strain you put on the political system more generally. Um, but when you, that that would be my perspective as an ob, as, as 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 an external observer. Um, you you would you would have more expertise in that, but I, I would certainly see advantages in that regard. Okay, but then if you're looking at sort of rights based um, solutions, then naturally this will involve sort of larger government, more spending, perhaps create a situation where judges are much more involved in policy decisions, which creates a situation where politicians are obsolete then and makes elections then more challenging as well because you can't really make the change perhaps that you would like to make. Um, so really just from that perspective, you know, how do you feel that this can be deliverable, particularly in the context of a devolved administration? Uh, sorry, that's that's a very good that's a very good uh, set of questions there. Um, I must say, I mean, and this is maybe where the minimalist maximalist thing comes in. Um, I'm not sure you. I think it would be quite possible to design a bill of rights that didn't radically judicialize many different aspects of our land life. Um, I, I, I think it would be quite possible to have a floor of rights at a certain degree of judicial protection um, that would, as I said, actually in a funny sort of way, free up space for more political choice. Um, precisely because if you give legal protection to a certain set of issues, a certain level of guaranteed rights, and you put those in the Bill of Rights box and you say there's a certain degree of embedded protection there in a way that frees up debates to be had on everything else that's not in that box. Whereas at the moment, the, the rights issues are very closely interconnected with other elements. I mean, I, I keep on coming back to the protocol because I think the protocol illustrates this really, 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 really starkly. Um, the, the, the future political discussion about the protocol, and let's face it, with the four-year renewal mechanism, or, or, or the regular renewal mechanism, the protocol is going to be a constant subject of debate um, between, within Northern Ireland and between Northern Ireland and, 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 and wider aspects of the UK and the EU and Ireland and the Republic of Ireland in general. Um, that permanent political sore that the protocol is going to represent, the, the, the issues it arises, are amplified precisely because there are human rights, equality, and non-discrimination issues made part of that package. And it actually, I think, complicates the political decision-making that's involved. And I, and I do think, um, yes, there is a potential judicialization, potential legalization effect achieved when you put things away in a, in, a, in a Bill of Rights box and you have a certain level of judicial protection. But at the same time, in a funny sort of way, I think that can free up politics to happen outside of that space, as opposed to what happens at the moment, where if you want the concerns about human rights and equality, non-discrimination rights tend to leak into multiple different aspects. So um, debates about state aid, this is what's happening with the protocol, debates about state aid and the customs relationship between Northern Ireland and, and, and the rest of the UK suddenly become charged with the extra freight baggage of all the human rights equality issues being part of that debate. Whereas if they were in a Bill of Rights framework, then the protocol debate would frankly, I think, be 
uh, it would be less charged at least. Um, so in other words, that's a roundabout way of saying, I think that legalization and, and protection through a Bill of Rights framework, depending on how you want to frame that Bill of Rights framework, can in a way f free up more space for uh, genuine political debate and make it, make it less charged, less sort of do or die when it comes to human rights issues. Um, as for cost elements, I'm, 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 I think you could have a Bill of Rights that wouldn't substantially load on additional state costs. I, 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 I have to say, I think that could be, I, I, I think that could be engineered. And bear in mind, for example, when it comes to equality and non-discrimination rights, the, the key issue is almost to preserve what currently exists rather than engaging rather than in whole scale radical re-engineering of Northern Irish society to achieve a more uh, a deeper equality and discrimination vision. That's what some that's what what I'm in a way what I'm talking to you today about. With a Bill of Rights framework you may want to delve much deeper into the equality terrain, of course. But it would be possible to have a a a a a a, a, a slightly less ambitious Bill of Rights. And um, that would certainly um, get rid of some of the tensions or reduce some of the tensions that, that the Brexit process has, has currently generated. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Michelle. We'll go to the members that are joining us via Starleaf. So I've got Mark. Thanks, Chair. Hello. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to Colin for the, the, the presentation, but no, I'm fine, Chair, there's no questions on that. No bother. John? Uh, Chair, the point I was looking to make has been covered, so thank you very much for the presentation, Professor. Right, that's grand. Well, Colin, thank you very much for joining us today again, and thanks for your contribution, and we can... Uh, yeah, uh, my pleasure. You. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, um, the next um, presentation we have is item number three. We have a briefing on the challenges facing the North and a Bill of Rights by Brian Gormley and Dr. Ann Smith from the uh, Committee on the Administration of Justice. So, Brian is the Director of CAJ and Dr. Ann Smith is from the Executive. CAJ is an independent human rights non-governmental organisation affiliated to the International Federation for Human Rights. It's actively campaigned for a Bill of Rights for the North since 1986. And you'll remember that a few weeks ago we heard from Daniel Holder of CAJ and Patricia McKeown of Unison in their capacities as co-conveners of the Equality Coalition on the 22nd of October. So Brian and Anne, you're very welcome if you want to begin your briefing. Well, thanks very much, Chair, um, and good afternoon, everybody. And um, thank you for this invitation to uh, address the committee. Um, I'll kick off, and then uh, Anne uh, can come in um, uh, shortly afterwards, if that's OK. Um, so my name is Brian Gormley, and I've been director of CAJ since 2011. Um, and as I say, I'm accompanied today by Dr. Anne Smith, who's a member of our executive, uh, but also part of the Bill of Rights uh, project that we referenced in our written evidence. I suppose at the outset, uh, I should make a declaration of interest. In 2008, I was an independent consultant and I worked with the Human Rights Commission in developing its advice on the Bill of Rights. I attended every meeting of the Commission that considered its advice and had a particular hand in developing its criteria for deciding whether a given right arose out of the particular circumstances uh, of Northern Ireland. I thought then and uh, I think now that the 2008 advice, while not perfect, was the basis for a workable and effective Bill of Rights which would have benefited uh, all our people. The evidence we gave a few weeks ago as part of the Equality Coalition focused on how the Bill of Rights could have helped in the solution of long-lasting divisive issues that this Assembly has faced. Only last week controversy arose over the use of the St Andrews veto and we just published a briefing on how a Bill of Rights could have impacted on that situation. Um, we can talk about that more if, uh, if you wish. However, the focus of our evidence today is on the future. 
how a human rights approach formalized in a Bill of Rights could bring focus, stability and direction to our path over the next very difficult and complex months and years. There can be no return to the old normal in 2021. Whatever happens about a Brexit deal, Northern Ireland will be in a unique situation on the 1st of January, and we will have to find homegrown solutions to new arising problems. Our people are unlikely to accept a post-pandemic return to the old normal of an under-resourced health and social care service dependent on the work of the lowest paid and which fails the old, the poor and the ethnic minorities. Are the devolved institutions to lurch from crisis to crisis with long-term planning impossible? Will the failure to deal with the legacy of conflict continue to leak poison into our, into our society? And will we sleepwalk into a constitutional crisis that emphasises only division? The alternative is a new normal that's based around a coherent and uniting set of principles. Human rights benefit everyone and cannot be used to oppress anyone. They are not an alternative to politics, but give a unifying and coherent direction. Take the task of preparing a, a programme for government. If a human rights approach is adopted, it will be based on the principles of identifying the neediest members of society and remedying their situation, participation of those affected, equality and non-discrimination, transparency and accountability, and clear benchmarks. It would also be given direction by specific rights recognised in international law, such as the rights to health, education, housing, food, work and equal access to justice. A Bill of Rights would craft these into achievable and relevant laws for our particular circumstances. There's plenty of room for political debate and decision on various ways in which the desired ends might be achieved. There's plenty of room for technical expertise and the input of those who will have to deliver what politicians decide. But there would be a common unifying direction. So where are we in this debate about a Bill of Rights? Very often a human rights approach is derided and dismissed as naive and the advantages of a real politique attitude lauded instead. This implies deals and horse trading, bribes and inducements or repression, the carrot and stick zero sum approach of the real world. In fact, this approach is uniquely unsuited to divided societies where people have incompatible national aspirations and allegiances. In split societies like Northern Ireland, a zero-sum approach where the only choices are supremacy or submission leads inevitably to conflict. Where national aspiration is one of the interlocking distinguishing features that determine identity, respect and fairness are much more negotiable currency than carrot and stick. Is there a consensus in this assembly on a comprehensive Bill of Rights? Perhaps not. Is there a majority for it? Perhaps so. Whatever the position, this committee has the responsibility to recommend the best way forward to its peers and to the UK government. We urge that recommendation to be in favour of a workable, effective and comprehensive Bill of Rights. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Is it okay if I come in, Chair? Of course, Sam. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I too would like to thank 
Um, thank you for this opportunity to give evidence. Um, as Brian said, I'm here wearing two hats. One as an executive member of the CAJ. The other hat is um, I'm one half of a Bill of Rights project funded by Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust. I'm working at Ulster University in the Law School and the Transitional Justice Institute as a senior lecturer. And the other half of that project is Professor Colin Harvey at Queen's University Belfast. Um, I'll talk briefly about the project as it's specifically referenced um, in the written evidence, as Brian pointed out. But before doing so, I just want to say that it, it's great to see that, you know, for the first time in 14 years since the St Andrews Agreement, that there is now a formal process to take forward a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. The passing of a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights was an important part of the 1998 peace agreement. So it's to be welcome to see it back on the political agenda. And we hope that our Bill of Rights project can feed into that um, political process. So I'll talk briefly about our Bill of Rights project. What we did as part of that project was that we took the Commission's advice that was submitted in 2008 and translated it into a draft model bill. If showing it here. And the reason we, we did that was to was very much for a practical approach. It was to say that you know this is how it could be done. Um, and we launched our draft model bill and asked for feedback. Now it's important to note that we acknowledged that the Commission's advice was not unanimous, both within the Commission at that time and outside the Commission. However, rather than starting off um, on a blank piece of paper and to respect the spirit and the commitment of the agreement, we concluded that the advice was a strong basis on which to proceed. So the feedback highlighted that the, the draft model bill, firstly, that it was submitted, the advice was submitted in 2008. We're living in a completely different world today. We didn't have Brexit. We didn't have COVID-19. Um, so the feedback highlighted that the advice needs to be updated. Other feedback highlighted that there were certain areas um, that needed stronger protections and the, the following um, were highlighted, but they're certainly not limited to, to these specific areas. Stronger provisions on children's rights, a stronger equality clause, the inclusion of refugee rights, stronger provisions in relation to women's rights, especially reproductive rights, and the inclusion of marriage equality for same-sex couples. Now, some of those major social issues have had notable success via the Westminster Parliament. Um, but that does not mean that we do not need a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. A Bill of Rights supplements and complements existing legislation and provides an overarching framework, provides core safeguards. The other area that was highlighted and was a, a constant theme in, in the feedback was that Brexit. Professor Colm O'Caneda has highlighted in his evidence the, the serious challenges and concerns that Brexit poses in terms of human rights and equality protections. So in terms of to bring my briefing to a close, as part of the project put forward a number of recommendations, one of which was that in order to respect the 1998 peace agreement, legislation must be passed at Westminster, as this is the approach committed to in the agreement, and that there should be a recommendation of enactment based on an update of the Commission's advice. And while the Bill of Rights needs to be in Westminster legislation, a positive report from this committee would be extremely helpful in terms of convincing the UK government to adhere to its responsibilities and obligations 
in order to bring forward a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. So thank you very much. Thank you both very much for, for the presentation, uh, both your oral presentation and uh, the, the written contribution that you provided. I want to ask you, we've, we've had the conversation over the past com number of weeks about the right to health care and there are different, I suppose, perspectives on, on that and how that can ever be fully achieved. And you made reference there to the, the CAJ uh, briefing paper in relation to what happened last week. And I suppose much of the narrative particularly on, in the media and on social media over, over the course of the past number of weeks, has almost pitted against, against health concerns, economy concerns, and obviously there are health implications for any economic decision that's taken as well. But I wondered if you could outline how you feel that a Bill of Rights would encourage a, a government or ministers of any jurisdiction to prioritise health uh, concerns, particularly, I suppose, in the context of the pandemic that we're we're currently in. Yeah. Well, if I could come back on uh, on that, um, obviously, uh, this kind of issue is in all our minds at the moment, uh, and in particular when um, we're all going to be faced with the task of uh, rebuilding a health and social care uh, service. Um, the point about including a, a, a social right like the right to health is about giving a direction. It's not about judges taking over policy. Um, it's about uh, prioritizing the health needs of the people when you're talking about policy in terms of building hospitals in developing provision uh, and so on. And it's subject, like all social and economic rights, uh, to the principle of progressive realization. We progressively realize year on year the uh, attainment of the highest possible uh, standard of uh, physical and mental health. That's what a right to health means. It doesn't take away from politics because how do you achieve uh, the best standard of health care is, of course, a matter for political debate and no court would interfere in the decisions arising out of that. Where a court might interfere is if in a case, and I'm not describing the events of last week, but were it to be the case, that a political party, for example, wielded a veto for entirely, uh, for reasons entirely unconnected with health, to block a mechanism that was designed to protect and increase health, then that might very well uh, fall foul of the principle of no regression, no backward movement in uh, guaranteeing uh, people's health. So uh, the briefing that we, we put out, and maybe you, you have it, if not, um, uh, we can certainly uh, get it to you, is quite detailed. Uh, and it does describe the genesis of the St. Andrews uh, veto and also the ex uh, to what extent it's, it's been used. Uh, as I say, uh, we're not claiming that uh, the exercise of the veto uh, last week uh, would have broken. Uh, a Bill of Rights, but it may well have, because if you have a direction towards achieving the highest standard uh, attainable in terms of health care, and for unconnected reasons uh, that is blocked, then that could easily fall foul uh, of a Bill of Rights. Yeah. Can I just um, add on as well to what Brian ha has said, that and, and this was also mentioned in the previous evidence by um, Professor Okineda in terms of the rule of courts. Um, my opinion is that the, a Bill of Rights that only lives in courtroom wouldn't be a, a document worth having. A Bill of Courts should be used as a last resort. And when courts have to be involved, then they should be regarded as an accountability mechanism it's not about taking power away from um, elected representatives. Bills of rights are there to, as I mentioned in my briefing, they're there to, to provide, it's there to provide core safeguards. It's there to inform how power is exercised 
and how policies are designed. Yeah. Thank, thank you both for that. I want to ask another question. Um, towards the end of your briefing, you talked about the constitutional, I suppose, flux that we're currently in, and I suppose some of the conversations that are being having that are being had now because of of Brexit and people's different input to that. And you mentioned that a Bill of Rights, if it were to be created now in the context that the North is part of the UK, where nationalists are seen as a minority in, in the broader UK, that that then would work as a protection if we were to have a united Ireland for unionists who may then become a minority in a, on a 32 county basis. I wondered if you could expand on that. Well, in my view, we have to go back to the whole purpose of the peace agreement or the whole premise on which it was based. And that was to deal with the constitutional question by saying, well, look, a majority of people at the moment want uh, to retain the union uh, and a minority uh, want a united island. Uh, if that changes, then there will be a referendum. And if that votes for United Ireland, that decision will be uh, respected. So that was the constitutional deal. But in the meantime, the idea was to create a society in Northern Ireland that was based on human rights and equality. And you cannot mistake that purpose if you read the agreement. And it was to create a society which could be shared, to which everybody could give allegiance on the basis of its fairness, if you like, rather than its national identity. So in those circumstances, the whole idea of a Bill of Rights as part of the panoply of protections for rights and equality that the uh, agreement uh, constructed uh, was would be to deal with any change in the constitutional status uh, of this region, uh, as well as in maintaining its existing uh, one. So, in other words, a Bill of Rights would, of course, be for everyone anyway, but the clear presumption would be that it would survive and should survive any change in the constitutional uh, character uh, of Northern Ireland. So you, we can uh, develop that debate and look at if we're having conversations on the constitutional future, which seems very sensible, to look at what other structures of the um, Good Friday Agreement should be retained were there to be a united island. But without any question, a Bill of Rights would give a firm foundation to make sure that everybody would have their rights at least as firmly protected in the future uh, as they are today. Yeah, and, and just to add to that as well, um, I was um, listening to a, a conversation yesterday actually um, about um, it was constitutional conversations and um, it was the Bill of Rights was raised in that particular context. And as Brian says that, and it's so important to get this narrative across that, that Bills of Rights, human rights, they are universal, the universality of human rights. And they are for everyone. They're not just from, for one minority or the majority. They are for everyone. I think that's key. It's not a zero-sum argument. We can yeah. improve people's rights without taking away from anyone else's. But thank you both. I'm going to pass now to the Vice Chair, Mike. Chair, thank you, and good afternoon to Brian and Anne, and thanks for your engagement. Um, Brian, you, you, you made a point about under-resourcing in, the, in the, the health service here, um, and I absolutely agree with you, and I remember 10 and more years ago, Michael Majimsey as Health Minister. Uh, making that point, uh, being incredibly accurate uh, in terms of the money that was required for the health service over a two or three year period. I mean, measured in, in billions, I think he got it to within three decimal points, but he didn't get the money. 
So I'm with you on that, but would you also accept that, that there's an equal issue in terms of the fact that the health service is under recalibrated <coughs> to be fit for purpose? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by uh, under calibrated or... Well, um... I think we all agree from Ben Goa and previous Donaldson and all the rest that, that we need significant transformation. Yes, indeed. And uh, there can be no question about that. If there ever was a question about it, then the impact of COVID has, has demonstrated uh, the, the, the lacks. It's demonstrated the question of low pay. It's demonstrated the lack of uh, staff uh, on a, a, a long term uh, basis. It's demonstrated that the poor get sicker in our society. It's demonstrated overall the nature of inequality in society. So it is, of course, quite right that the health service needs to be transformed and that will need uh, more resources. And uh, amongst other things, it's about the willingness of the population, uh, at least those who can afford it, to pay more in taxes to do that. But what we're arguing is that if you rebuild on the basis of a right to health, you've got a series of principles that I outlined, things like accountability, transparency, involving uh, patients and sick people in, in planning and so on, as well as uh, the right to the highest attainable standard of health and social care. If that's the guiding principle, then other matters like, oh, I'm a local MLA and I want to make sure a hospital uh, stays in my constituency or whatever, are not the guiding uh, uh, principles of how uh, this reconstruction is going to go forward. It is about um, uh, a direction, uh, a, a common purpose in going forward. As I've said, there's plenty of room for debate about how you achieve the common purpose, and there always will be. Uh, but at least you've got a decision-making process that prioritizes health rather than any other extraneous issue. Uh, could, could I just add to that in terms of the, um, the issue of resources? In the context of a Bill of Rights, it would be it, it would be within the maximum available resources so they would look at you know what are the constraints on resources so that's important and brian talked about in terms of a um, progressive realization non-regression the concept that i used are the maximum available resources there is guidance guidelines in terms of you know what do these actually mean the general comments from the Committee on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights provides clear guidance as to what those phrases mean, and it's so important that, that people know when those what those when people talk about those phrases, well, what exactly does it mean? Well, and could 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 you give us maybe an indication because I'm I'm not aware of that, and, and hopefully we'll we will take a look at that in more detail. But if you're having an argument about the maximum available resources, and the health minister, as Michael McGimsey did, is making this case, but the education minister is saying, well, I need it for schools, and the infrastructure minister is saying, I need it for roads. I mean, surely that can only be resolved through a political agreement. Yes, in terms of, there's always going to be a balancing when it comes to rights. And especially then when there are when there's an issue about resources as well. But what I was referring to, and I don't have the um, the general comments at hand, but the Committee on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, they go through what what exactly does the maximum available resources mean? Um, so it would give you a, a, an idea as to how, you know, how do you balance the resources, you know, how do you balance the budget? Okay, I'm, I'm sure we'll take a look at that, Anne, thank you. Do, do you believe that a Bill of Rights could have affected um, how we have dealt with the pandemic and specifically uh, the number of deaths? 
Well, I think it could have. Um, and what you would be looking at in those circumstances, again, is the priority of health care. I'm sure a, a Minister of Health, for example, gets bogged down in the uh, details of uh, management issues, governance issues, resourcing issues, how many beds have we got, where can we put them, and, and so on. The point is not to take away that decision-making from the minister and colleagues and so on, but it's to say, but in all of this, the guiding principle has to be, are we improving people's health choices? Now, you know, in those circumstances, would we have had the same crisis over PPE if that had been gathered and prepared for, uh, looking forward on the basis of exercises done about pandemics and so on? Would we have had people discharged to care homes uh, without being tested for COVID-19? Uh, would we have had uh, I mean, some of these decisions could uh, uh, have gone either way at the time uh, and in the hypothetical situation where we were working to uh, a, a Bill of Rights. But uh, such things like uh, the stopping of uh, uh, other health treatments uh, and, and so on. And if we'd had a Bill of Rights with a right to health care since the Good Friday Agreement, or even since 2008, we almost certainly would have had a health service that was better fit for purpose than the one that was forced to confront the, uh, the crisis uh, of the pandemic. Well, Brian, I have to put on record, I think that is highly speculative, that, that, that list of comments that you've just made. And I certainly hope you are not implying in any sense that anybody in charge of uh, driving the health service, such as the minister or the chief medical officer, is anything but focused on improving people's health choices. I'm not suggesting that for a moment. And I think I said that uh, uh, when, 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 when I was just speaking. Um, but the point is, are we to rely on the goodwill of who is in a particular position at the moment? Or are we, as a society, prepared to actually declare that people do have the right to the highest attainable standard of health care? No, it's, it's, and if we sorry, Brian, that, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Brian, but it, it's not about yeah. goodwill. It's about the professionalism of these people. Well, but yes, of course. But you can't guarantee professionalism in, in, in every circumstance. What I'm suggesting to you is that a Bill of Rights which includes this uh, provision actually gives you the certainty that whoever is in post, then the priorities uh, will be similar. And this is not about criticism of anybody who's in any particular post at the moment. I mean, the, the job of health minister this year must be one of the most difficult jobs that anybody has ever been asked uh, to do. And uh, I, I personally feel for Robin Swan in having to take the decisions and to fight for other decisions uh, in the executive. It's a difficult job. What I am saying, though, is that had we as a society expressed clearly our wish for this principle to be at the heart of all decision making, his job would have been easier and the health service would have been in a better position. I'm convinced of that. Okay, Brian and Anne, thank you. Thank you, Chair. All right. And we've got Michelle and Chris. So, Michelle. Okay, thank you. And thank you for your, um, for your presentation. In paragraph 10 of the document, which you provided with us, you talk about the pandemic and you're saying that the COVID-19 pandemic has put an existential question mark over our entire society in raising doubt about habits and structures that seemed fixed and certain and forcing novel and disturbing policy responses. Could you maybe um, expand on that, and particularly around the issue of forcing novel and disturbing policy responses? 
Well, I, I don't think uh, anybody would have wished to impose the restrictions on society that the pandemic has made necessary. Uh, and they are disturbing, not least in terms of their impacts on the day-to-day -day, uh, human rights of, of our entire population. We support those regulations, just for the avoidance of doubt, uh, because it's, it's reasonable to restrict rights in the pursuit of public health. And so long as those are proportionate, uh, then we are uh, prepared to support them. Uh, we have being disturbed at some of the enforcement issues, some of the issues about how legislation has been passed, and we've been uh, public in, uh, in, in those criticisms. But the real point of that paragraph is, I think, uh, obvious to everybody that the inequality in our society, the fact, for example, that people from minority ethnic background are getting sicker and dying more frequently uh, than uh, uh, people not from that background is a fact of life. Uh, the fact that poverty, overcrowding mean that people get sicker and die more frequently uh, has been clearly demonstrated uh, by the pandemic. So what it demonstrates from a human rights perspective is that our rights were not adequately protected before and presents us with the imperative to make sure that our rights are better protected after. Okay, but just in relation to this, is this, is this in response to what's happening in Northern Ireland, or is this a, a sort of a more of an overview of what's happening in the broader UK or, or elsewhere? Because I'm just curious well, about the data. Which, I'm just curious about the data in which you've based some of your, your comments. Well, it is, of course, a general statement. It, it doesn't purport to be a, a, an analysis of all the demographic data, uh, both in Northern Ireland and in the UK. But the broad figures are very clear. Uh, obviously, you've got the age factor. That is to do clearly with the nature of the disease. The fact that... Uh, the fact that... Um, people from a minority ethnic background uh, are, are dying uh, more frequently is clearly not to do with anything genetic or the nature of the disease. It is to do with living conditions. And uh, it, it's also clear that people from a poorer background are more likely to be infected, more likely to get sick and more likely to die. Uh, now, we can uh, uh, play around and delve into the statistics to get uh, a more nuanced picture, if you like, but the broad brush uh, evidence is clear that we are a deeply unequal society, our rights are inadequately protected, and they should be better protected in the future. No, it's just that we never, just that we're probably, I'm guessing we didn't ask for a thesis on this, but I suppose whenever you're making statements like that, you know, some evidence would, would be helpful too. Um, you um, we were obviously critical in the response to, um, to Mike there in relation to maybe an MLA who wants to protect a service in their constituency. Um, so I'm sort of curious that in your vision or your utopia of how this should play out in the future, um, what role you see for politicians? Because clearly in this rights-based solutions position that you're taking, um, you're driving things towards the judges as opposed to with and hold, with and taking it away from the politicians. Uh, I, I mean, I think as Anne has said, and, and will no doubt say again, um, we are not in, in favour of uh, 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 bringing every political decision into the courts. And that would not be the effect of, uh, uh, of a, a Bill of Rights. And, and I know you've heard uh, uh, evidence from Albie Sachs, amongst others, about how uh, uh, social and economic rights work in a Bill of Rights in South Africa. And there is not over-litigation uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of policy making. The politicians still have uh, a huge uh, role to play, for good or bad. Uh, and we did see in South Africa, as it happens, bad decision making around the HIV uh, epidemic. Um, but 
this is not a simple zero-sum judges or politicians. What you give to judges, you take away from politicians. It's not about that. It's about guiding principles as well as certain basic uh, uh, concepts such as no regression, that you don't go backwards when it comes to people's health, unless you're forced to by, uh, you know, an economic disaster or something like that. Uh, as Anne has also said, we're all only ever talking about doing what is possible to the maximum, uh, to using the maximum resources available. You can't wish into existence a utopia. And... Uh, what I'm describing is hardly a utopia. It is a society trying to do the best thing and saying that it's trying to do it. Uh, and I, I think when we're talking about issues and we focus very much on the right to health, and it's a good example, we've got to ask the contrary position. Why would anybody not want people to have the right to health? Are we to simply rely on what I described and Mike pulled me up of saying goodwill, or on the professionalism of people who get political posts? Or are we to say as a society, this is the direction we want to go in, and only if you blatantly disregard that direction will you end up in court? I think that's a right and proper way to organise a society. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Michelle. Yes, right. And um, just to add and to re reiterate what I had said earlier in terms of the roads of courts, they should be seen as the last resort when all the other institutional safeguards have failed. And when it does go to courts, comparative experience shows that even courts that have the 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 strong judicial power to set aside incompatible legislation. What they often do is they actually put the ball back into Parliament and give them a, a year or so to actually amend the incompatibility to make it human rights compliant. So there's a, like a type of dialogue that creates between the three branches of government. So it, it's not about taking power away from one branch and giving it to another branch. It shouldn't be bills of rights um, and the roads of courts, this judicialization of, of, of politics. It, it shouldn't be viewed like that because it, comparative experience shows that it isn't. And actually some academics would say that courts have been far too differential in their treatment. Okay, thank you. All right, Michelle. Christopher? Thank you, and thank you for um, your evidence thus far. Can I suggest that uh, what happened last week was actually the defence of people's economic rights? Because you said in your presentation that the poorest people get the sickest and have been most disproportionately affected by this. Can I suggest that by enabling the poorest people to go to their work, we actually what happened was a move to protect not only their economic rights, but also their health rights? Well, uh, I mean, I don't think it's our role to uh, second guess the political choices that have been made uh, around the executive uh, table. Um, but what in any situation you can have is a, co is a conflict of rights. Um, so, for example, uh, to take a completely different example, uh, the right to uh, protest, to march, is a, a fundamental right. If the police seal off a road to facilitate the march, they're also affecting the rights of people who are living in the neighbouring houses who can't get out of their houses and so on. So uh, while you've got the uh, Article uh, 10 right of uh, the freedom of assembly, you've also got the uh, Article 8 right uh, of uh, living uh, your own uh, private life without interference. So you have to go through a balancing exercise. Mm. And a balancing exercise requires you to say, what is the most serious right here? What is the biggest infringement? Uh, are we talking about mild inconvenience uh, compared to um, uh, um, a, a serious exercise of a, of a very basic right or what? In those circumstances, if you're going to argue 
that the only way you can improve people's uh, levels of poverty or, or levels of subsistence is by opening up all workplaces, opening up pubs and bars and so on, so that the economy in an indefinite future makes people uh, more wealthy, if you like, and therefore more healthy. If that's the argument, then that's a, a, an argument that would need to be balanced against the health advice about uh, imposing restrictions to prevent uh, pandemic infection. It's not for me to say which of those is right, but what it is, is a balancing exercise. Oh, absolutely. You might absolutely. very well think that exercising a veto in those circumstances is abandoning political compromise, but that's another matter. I absolutely agree with you in terms of, I think that there should be a, a right to freedom of assembly and the right to procession. I don't know any jurisdiction in the world that has a right to not be offended by other people doing that, but apparently the law is structured that way in Northern Ireland. Um, no, sir. In, in terms of well, uh, 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 Article 8 of the uh, uh, European Convention I was referring to, which is the right to a private life, and that also involves being able to move inside or outside your house. I was only using that example. Oh, no, I know you were. Uh, Characterising the nature of the parade or anything. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, I know that. Uh, you used the word in terms of when things end up in court. Uh, it would only be if there was blatant action that uh, could be acted upon. What's blatant to you might not be blatant to me. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, I think yeah. I think your, your your theme about balancing I think is absolutely right. I think there's so much of this stuff is about balance. Um, but I just um, do you, do you accept that that what one person considers to be a blatant uh, bad uh, act of bad faith by government, others clearly would not, and then that then becomes a matter for the courts to determine. Um, well, blatant is, uh, is of course a subjective uh, uh, term, uh, but in, if we had a law, then mm. it would be given legal effect, quite rightly, and in, in the end, jurisprudence would say what kind of breach of the principle uh, is uh, sufficiently blatant to be justiciable. Mm. Uh, and yes, that would be a legal decision, and yes, courts might have to decide that. But once they decided it, everybody would know, and would know the criteria uh, uh, that you had to take into account in making these decisions. And there is no suggestion that ministers would be in and out of court any more than they are today, by the way, and of course, uh, all uh, government decisions uh, can be uh, uh, criticised or subject to the law. So, for example, the Assembly cannot pass any law that is incompatible with the European Convention on Human Rights by domestic law. Mm. So, if, if the Assembly purported to do that, or indeed a minister or a department acts in contravention of the Human Rights Act, which enshrines the European Convention, uh, then you will be in court. The Bill of Rights, of course, extends that principle further, but it doesn't mean to say necessarily that you'd be in court any more often, because people would know the principles, how the law was being interpreted uh, by uh, case law, which is the way our system of uh, uh, law works. Hi. All right, Christopher. Okay. We've got John on Starleaf. John, do you have any questions? Start is following up from Christopher's comments about uh, on a few people, and this has been a theme throughout the, the discussions on, on the committee um, around the role of the courts, feed the role of the elected representative, and uh, I defend the role of the elected representative at all times. But as as has been said there uh, by Brian. We're already subject to judicial review um, by the courts. And indeed, we have a very low bar here for access to judicial review. And what departments then do is departments take measures to ensure that their, their minister is properly advised on all rules and regulations that govern their authority. But at times, and, and I face judicial review several times myself, uh, it's in relation to the interpretation of the law 
of the policies and procedures are open to contest, and sometimes the only way a community or a group within the community feel that can be uh, interrogated properly is through the courts, and you have to go to the courts, defend your position. The judge here both sides, and, and then, and then a, a, a judge will make that decision. I have to say, I well, my legal team won all but one of my judicial reviews, and then there was a nil-nil draw on the last one, which was uh, eventually turned into a one-nil draw for me, or one one-nil win for me. But you know, nobody wants to end up in court. But as, as an elected representative, we have to recognise that power can be abused, and it can be misinterpreted, but it can also be abused. And there has to be a balance against the abuse of political power. Uh, many of the things I wanted to touch on, uh, Brian uh, and Dr. Smith, have already uh, been been discussed. I was interested in the issue of how we, how, and since we don't have a Bill of Rights in front of us, it's difficult to interpret, but how the pandemic would have been managed if a Bill of Rights had been in place, because quite clearly, as has been stated, uh, though, those, on lower, those on lower incomes uh, from socially deprived backgrounds, ethnic minorities, or the victims to a higher percentage than other categories in our society and could or would a Bill of Rights been used to redirect uh, government policy in that regard? Um, I know you have touched on that, but just, do you want to explore that any further? Or, or has it been, for instance, has a Bill of Rights, to the best of your knowledge, been used in other jurisdictions which have a Bill of Rights to redirect government policy? Or has it been shown to ensure that government policy has acted in such a way which protects those minorities who are suffering the worst outcomes of this pandemic? Um, I think you've just put forward a brilliant idea for a research project, actually, <laughs> into what <laughs> the difference has been in jurisdictions with a Bill of Rights in handling the pandemic. And I really don't have uh, that uh, in information. Um, but I think it, it's a long-term thing. It isn't just about how the crisis was managed. It's about the nature of society and the long-term impact of, uh, of equality and, uh, and human rights being at the centre of, of policy making. Can I just, as you mentioned, uh, having had judicial reviews against you, um, one that was a win for CAJ back in 2015 was actually against the executive on the, on the question of an anti-poverty strategy. And we took a judicial review because it was in law from the St Andrews Agreement, actually, uh, that there should be a, an anti-poverty strategy. We went to court and argued that there wasn't one. And um, in, in response, it was argued by government lawyers that, oh, well, there was this policy and that policy. And the judge made a very strong statement about a strategy had to have a beginning, a middle and an end with benchmarks and, and so on. And that's exactly the kind of issue that could go, well, has been to court uh, in this particular case, but it's analogous to the kind of issues that would arise under a Bill of Rights. And what did it do? What did the court say? It didn't say, you will have an anti-poverty strategy that says this, this, and this. It said, you will have an anti-poverty strategy. Now, please go away and draft one. So it wasn't a question of laying down what should be in uh, an anti-poverty strategy. We have our own views about what a human rights uh, compliant anti-poverty strategy would look like, transparency involving people uh, going for the poorest first in terms of remedies and, and so on and so forth. But the court wouldn't say that. It simply says it's the law that you have to have a strategy. Please develop one. And, and, and that's a, a good example, I think, of the way uh, judicial review, if you like, would operate uh, under a Bill of Rights. Yeah, and, and uh, if, if we have an anti-poverty strategy, then those who are currently facing the worst outcomes from the pandemic would be protected against it. Uh, and of course, the best way to protect low-paid workers is to make sure they're not low-paid. Uh, so all people we advocate for low-paid workers now, I'm looking forward to them after the pandemic joining 
uh, the virtuous cause of ensuring that people are properly paid. Uh, I think Dr. Smith's looking at it. Sorry. Yes, thank you, John. Yeah, no, j j just to add in terms of the, um, you know, what comparative um, jurisdictions, what has happened there. It, to be brief, it, it's been a mixed bag. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some academics have argued that the, the courts haven't gone far enough in terms of um, their um, their judgments. And in, in some judgments, actually, it, it, it has taken the, the implementation, the enforcement of the court's decision so long that there was one example where the applicant who, who took the case to court actually died because it was so long. So that's why I think it's so important. Yes, the roles obviously do have a court, or do, <laughs> courts do have a role, but they, they should be seen as the last resort. The, in terms of you know, the purpose of a, of a Bill of Rights, you know, it, it's to inform how power is exercised. It is to um, inform and make sure that policies, legislation are human rights compatible in the first instance to preclude the need to go to court. But of course, there will always be that avenue open um, to people who then have to use the court as a last resort. Um, is a Bill of Rights a constitution? Is it the constitution uh, or, or a type of constitution, the rule book by which government plays by? And a number of yourselves and, and Dr. O'Connor previously in his presentation, uh, in my opinion, I have framed it in such a way that a Bill of Rights allows for a society coming out of conflict to do so in a more stable way, that you're not returning to, you're not constantly picking the sore of the conflict, um, that there is a rule book under which all sides know how they operate, regardless of who's the majority or who's the minority. And is, and finally then, does or, ha, or do bill, bills of right, rights evolve? Um, have has those nations and, and States and societies have used them. Have they evolved, and are they, are they of such a w nature that they can evolve easily over a period of time? Um, maybe um, uh, Anne was um, more able to answer the uh, second part of that, but I, I do think that um, in terms of what uh, Colm was saying, um, he was quite right in saying that uh, a Bill of Rights would be much more effective as a foundation document, if you like, of a peaceful Northern Ireland uh, than what we're looking at at the moment, which is a kind of cobbled together piecemeal uh, protocol, obviously faced with the disruption of, uh, uh, of Brexit. And in that sense, uh, in a, a layman's sense, I think you would call a Bill of Rights as constitutional in the sense of defining the nature of the society we want to live in. In a legal sense, of course, in the British system, uh, Parliament is always sovereign, so you can't have a law that can't be changed by sovereign, uh, by, by, by Parliament. But there are ways of entrenching. So the Human Rights Act is entrenched to the extent that you can only amend it very explicitly. You know, you can't amend it by implication, by passing a law which is incompatible with it. On the contrary, it will, the, 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 the law that's incompatible with it will be uh, not struck down necessarily, but a declaration of incompatibility will be made. So to that extent, you could legally entrench uh, a, a Bill of Rights it would need to be passed at Westminster again. Obviously, in the UK system uh, of law, there is no written constitution which is superior to Parliament. Um, but in every sense that matters, I would agree with the characterisation of a Bill of Rights as being a constitution for this region. Yeah, and, and just to come in there in terms of the um, the second part um, of your question, John, the uh, yes to a very short answer to your um, and direct um, answer to your question. Um, I, in terms of the Canadian Charter of Fundamental Rights, for example, there have been several amendments to the Charter. Um, in terms of another example of how bills of rights have evolved is through the judicial interpretation of rights. 
um, the way rights are framed in, in, in bills of rights. For example, I'm looking at the equality provision. Um, they would it would be um, drafted in a way that would enable um, the attitudes of the society to reflect the the, the current um, attitudes of, of of a particular social issue. And um, so it is very important that bills of rights can evolve with time. Something that is set in stone wouldn't last too long, um, and, and that's important. And we, we talk about the, the European Convention on Human Rights has been mentioned on several occasions, and understandably so, because it's incorporated uh, um, into our domestic law, Well, most of the provisions are. Um, and, and that's been described as, as a living instrument, and that has evolved as well. So, yes... I am. Um, there are examples. Okay, thank you, Arnold Brown. Thanks, John. Uh, just when, when John had asked his question there around, I suppose, international examples of a Bill of Rights and how they've um, been exercised in the context of the pandemic and a government's response, have, have you looked at the Brazilian example? I, I, I believe that Obviously, Brazil has got a fairly high um, infection rate, but I think families that had been affected were able to use the, the Bill of Rights and um, commitments made in the, in the Bill of Rights that weren't followed a, a, as remedy there. Yes, I believe so. Um, we're, we're, we're not, uh, at least I'm not <laughs> an expert on the Brazilian uh, situation, but we, we have actually uh, uh, talked about it a little. And, you know, it's, it, it's difficult to know without knowing in detail the politics of a, 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 another country, and a, a very huge country, of course. Um, but you have had a, um, what shall we call it nicely, Bolsonaro as a, as a, a COVID sceptic uh, in, in charge of the country. And obviously part of the result is a, a runaway uh, a, a, a epidemic. Uh, and one would have to say that legal recourse in these circumstances is unlikely to be fast enough to, uh, to, to change things if you've got a political uh, executive which is determined not uh, to uh, fight the pandemic as, um, uh, as is recommended by uh, health experts. Um, so it's no panacea. We're not creating a utopia here. But what we are saying is that in the long term, a Bill of Rights would have a positive impact on society, on society's fairness, and therefore on its ability to face, uh, to face crises. Yeah, yeah and, and just to add to that, um, the reference to Brazil is in the, the written um, submission by the uh, Equality Coalition there in terms of um, the um, the right of the veto that was used last week. And it, it just so happens whenever I read that uh, a draft of that, um, I said to uh, to, um, to Daniel about, you know, th there's so much scope there for an, an academic article. So actually Daniel and myself are going to expand on that. So whenever we have done more research into the situation in Brazil, we'll be more than happy to um, to give you a, a copy of, of that article. But it, it's, it's, as I said, we only um, talked about that yesterday, so it's, it's very early stages. Brilliant. Look, Dr. Smith, Brian, thank you very much for, for joining us this afternoon and we'll let you... You go at this point. All right, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay, members, so um, item number four in our agenda is chairperson's business, and we don't have any this week. We can then go to the draft minutes, which you'll find at page 37 of your pack, if members are happy to agree. Content. Yep. Brilliant. Um, number six, we have no matters arising. Um, agenda item seven, uh, page 41, correspondence. We just have an invitation from um, CARES NA for an event next Friday, so if people want to RSVP to that. Friday or Thursday? I think it's Friday. No, it's Thursday. Sorry, I'm wrong. Thanks for raising that, because I probably had that in my diary as Friday. Um, and then the forward work programme. 
if uh, members are content to um, agree that as well. Mm -hmm. And if anyone has any other business? No, oh, no, no, okay. no. Okay, so uh, same time, same place next week. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.